fresh and get excited as we open up our hearts and the Word of God and, and just see the triumph which we have in Christ. And if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior or you thought you did and the Lord convicts you otherwise, today's the day Amen. to be saved. Yep. That's what it's about. And uh, so uh, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is good to see some faces that I've not seen in a little while, and uh, we pray the Lord encourages you. This morning, we, as we lift up our Lord in worship, and you're joining us through Facebook Live, we welcome you to services, and we do ask that you continue to pray for Pastor um, and his recovery, and the Lord heal him. Also, remember, uh, continue to remember Sister Jamie in your prayers, and she, she goes through her affliction and her trials of faith. Um, the message this morning is the resurrection is essential to the gospel. The resurrection is essential to the gospel. We're going to see the resurrection, of course, this morning, um, but we're going to look and see how it has to be completed in order for the gospel to be completed. In chapter 15, we're going to look at a, a couple different places. It's a very long chapter. We're not going to be able to look at every verse exhaustively, but certainly it's a wonderful book to go home and read, and it'll bring me a blessing. Chapter 15, verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, as we humbly come before you in your word and your mighty power to save. Father, we praise you. We worship you this morning. For our Lord and Savior has indeed risen, and he is our conquering Savior. He's our King. Father, with all of the, the gospel and the hope of the deliverance, Lord, that you give and the blessings of eternal life are all through the accomplished work of Jesus Christ. All glory to him and all power do his name. Father, we do pray that if there's one here who does not know you as your, your personal, their personal Savior, Father, that you'll convict them, bring the light, the darkness that is within them, Give them the knowledge of the Savior and the love, Father. May they experience, Father, first of all, the terror that comes, Lord, knowing we are sinners, that we'll be cast out before your presence, Father. And then give them, Father, the conviction to repent and to believe upon the gospel and accept you as Jesus Christ, uh, their Savior. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So... There's a couple different places we can certainly look in the Bible to teach and talk and preach about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, we chose Corinthians, but I'm going to sum up what the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, say about the resurrection. Um, it is The resurrection is the crowning event in God's redemptive story, history. The resurrection is the cornerstone of Christianity. The resurrection is the foundation of the gospel. It's the guarantee of heaven. The message of the Bible is that death does not end existence for any person. Every living being who has ever been born and lived will live forever. That's true. You'll live forever either in hell or in heaven. You'll live forever either in eternal death or eternal life, in everlasting suffering or everlasting joy. Not You will not live in a disembodied spirit, but you will indeed have a body, and you will live forever 
within this body. You know, there's so many Netflix shows or different shows, and some of them I see, some of them I stumble upon, and it seems the world has this idea of what life after death is. If there is a life after death, uh, there was this one show on Prime, Amazon Prime, and it was called Upload, I believe, and after death, they're uploaded into a computer, and then they live out their existence after death in this simulated computer environment where you have operators here on Earth <laughs> operating their environment. Others believe there's just oblivion. There's nothing. There's black after death. But that's not what the Bible teaches, and that's not uh, the Lord God. That's not the way that he will do it. And that is the truth this morning, that we all will live forever not in a disembodied spirit, but we will have a body and be in bodily form, for we all will be raised from the dead Amen. one day. The resurrection of Jesus Christ bodily from the death and grave is a pledge, and it's a promise to all who believe in him that we also will be raised in bodily form, just as he was, and that we will enter into our eternal bliss to be forever and ever in the presence of God and worship him. The resurrection is not just a feature of Christianity. It's not something just tacked on to the end, but it is an essential truth of the gospel. Without it, you have no gospel. Uh, the whole point of the gospel is to rescue people from hell so that they can go to heaven. And at the same time, we bring all glory to God's grace. The resurrection of Christ guarantees our resurrection. The resurrection of Christ and the bodily resurrection of believers is unique to Christianity. There is no such thing as a resurrection without a body. That's not a resurrection. Christianity does not teach that you live in some spirit form everlasting in heaven. It does not teach that or in hell, but rather that you have a body having been raised from the dead, that you will occupy in one of these two places forever and ever. You will either have a body equipped for glory or equipped for hell. Because the resurrection of Christ is so critical to us, the resurrection always seems to be attacked by Satan. So even during when in the Gospels, when we saw Jesus raised from the dead, that we saw that uh, uh, certain uh, Jewish leaders wanted to pay off the, the soldiers to say that, you know, the body was stolen. There's always this cover-up. Throughout all of history, there has been nothing more that secular world, the atheists, all of them want to do than to discover the body of Jesus. Yeah. But they've never discovered the body of Jesus because he rose from the dead and he ascended to the Father. So Satan will sometimes overtly attack. Sometimes he will covertly attack and he'll muddle the message of Easter, won't he? He'll muddle it. He'll say, okay, well, we can't prove that he didn't raise. Well, let's just throw in some you know, paganism and some muddleness and let's, let's distract everyone with, with bunnies and eggs and candy and and things of that nature to distract us from the message. Today we're going to look at three truths in Corinthians. The definition of the gospel is complete because of the resurrection of Jesus. The accomplishment of the gospel uh, is because of the resurrection of Jesus. And the promise of the gospel is complete because of the resurrection of Jesus. First of all, in verse 1 through 3, just as a, a side note, I, this, uh, I was studying this this morning, and the Lord uh, you know, made this pop out at me, and I hope it pops out at you. But it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you. First, the gospel is to be preached, it's to be taught, and a simple truth. I wonder how many churches today that are gathered uh, for Easter services are actually preaching the gospel. We're actually teaching the gospel. But now look at this. Not only are we to deliver it, but you are to receive it. Because it says here, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Are you enduring in the gospel? Are you still standing? You've, we've, we've spoken it. Somebody spoke it to you. You received it. Do you still have it? 
Are you enduring in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you standing upon it? Verse 2, he says, this gospel, the result of the gospel of Jesus Christ is you are saved, by which also ye are saved. And it says here, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, those are the ones who have not endured in the gospel. Those are the ones who had received it and had uh, maybe made a commitment once in their life, but have neglected it, put it away, ignored it, even maybe despised the gospel. They've not endured. They believed in vain. Their belief was useless or empty. But he says in verse 3, this is the gospel. This is where we want to start. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died. Here's the three elements of the gospel. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried. There's the second element of the gospel. And that he rose again. The third. If you take away any of those three, it's not the gospel. All three are essential to the gospel. Well, let's look at this. Um, you know, I love that song. I don't know if you, you sang it, but I love that song. One day, it says, Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried. My sins far away. Rising, he justified. Freely forever. One day, he's coming. Oh, glorious day. Well, right in that course is the whole gospel, isn't it? But, and it says, um, He died for our sins in verse 3. That's imperative to the gospel. And it says in Romans 5, 8, you don't have to turn there, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's essential. It's an imperative for us to be saved that Christ had to die. He had to die. Uh, in Romans 3, 25, it says, when whom God has set forth. In Romans 3, God had just, or Paul had just written and God inspired that all of this evidence that we are as filthy rags before God in our own worth. In our own worth. So what did God do? You know, God would have been just knowing we are all breakers of the law, knowing that we cannot keep the righteousness which is of the law, that we're all sinners. God would have been just in sending us all to hell to pay for our sins forever and ever and ever. That he would have been just in doing it. There's nothing that you could have complained about because it was our own fault. We brought it upon ourselves to break God's law. It's your choice to break God's law. But what did he do? <laughs> the glorious gospel that in Romans 3.25 he says, whom God, who Jesus Christ, has set forth to be a propitiation, a covering, through faith in his blood, Christ had to die. Christ had to bleed. Christ had to be sacrificed. Christ had to die so that we may declare his righteousness, his value. We declare Christ's value. I stand before God, you know, one day at the judgment seat, and Lord, I do not declare any value in me, but I declare the value in your precious son who loved me and gave himself for me that I may be set free, that I may not be condemned, that you saved me from the penalty that I deserved. And so we see that Christ must have died for the remissions of sins. In verse 4, it says that he was buried. He had to have been buried to prove that he died. Because he, the, you know, the, there's these theories out there, the swoon theory that Jesus just passed out or that he, uh, you know, just came to. No, Jesus completely died. And so he was buried. And lastly, verse 4, he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. It's imperative. It's imperative that Jesus died and was buried and that he rose again. In Acts 2.23, it says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, he's talking about Jesus, that ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up. <laughs> God hath raised up Jesus, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Jesus was delivered for our offenses, but raised again for our justification in Romans 4, 25. 
And God is, so Jesus had a raise because God is just in justifying the ungodly. How can God forgive me and not somebody else who's just as bad as me? Well, God did so not by sweeping my sins under the rug and punishing this other person for their sins. Not because I'm better. No, it's because that I have repented. I've, I've humbled myself. I've realized I have no value before God, that I'm a sinner in danger of going to hell in the lake of fire because God is your creator. God is the author of everything you see outside and all the feelings you have inside. But where we rebel against authority, it's in our nature to do that. We want to be our own God. Right? We, we just want to, uh, we don't want somebody telling us what to do. We, we've dealt with that all our childhood, right? So who, who I want to tell myself what to do. I want things to be on my terms. I want to go here. I want to go there. I want to do that. I don't want to answer to anybody that I don't have to answer to. But you will answer to God. You will. It is appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. And we see that here that God is just in justifying the ungodly because of the resurrection. When Jesus arose, Jesus arose and demonstrated that Jesus Christ's righteousness is now evaluated by God, not mine. Had, and we're, we're going to get into this a little bit more, but Jesus Christ arose. God validated that Christ's uh, sacrifice was accepted and valued, and now we have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. The very definition of the gospel depends on all three, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, being accomplished. And without the resurrection, there is no gospel. Secondly, the accomplishment of the gospel de demands on the resurrection. First, I didn't give you the first. The definition of the gospel demands that there be the resurrection of Jesus. Secondly, the accomplishment of the gospel demands on the resurrection. In verse 12, if you look, I said we were going to be skipping around a little bit. He says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. It's empty. It's worthless. And your faith is also vain, empty, worthless. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised, up Jesus, or he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be, that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. You do not have an atonement. You do not have a sin substitute. You do not have a sacrifice. You are still, you're going to go before the throne of God just as any other lost person would in your own sins. You would not have a sacrifice for sin. You would not have a savior. You would have to, you are condemned. And if Christ, verse 17, be not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of men most miserable. Now looking at this, the accomplishment of the gospel depends on Jesus Christ raising. And that's what it says here. That if Christ did not raise, our faith is in vain. Our preaching's in vain. Everything's in vain. Um, it says that even the, the apostles were false witnesses of God because Jesus himself testified. That means that Jesus, the promises Jesus has made in his ministry, he would have lied. Or they would have not came true. And if there's lies or any kind of deceit in the Bible, uh, we, we can assume any, uh, none of it true. But the Bible is without error. And so we can assume all of it to be true. But Jesus would himself would have been a liar. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it again. He would have been a liar had he not raised. If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. How important is the resurrection? It's very important. If there's no resurrection, there's no gospel. That's right. And if there's no gospel, there's no salvation. Amen. No resurrection, no gospel. No gospel, no salvation.
But we see the accomplishment of the resurrection of Christ did mean the completion of the gospel. In Matthew 121, the angels came and says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. That's why he came. Not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Pilate said, Art thou a king? And he says, To this end I came. When he went to the cross, he said, For this very end I came. He came to be the suffering sacrifice, the Savior. Oh, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that your sins have been paid for by Christ upon the cross? And that he accomplished the gospel. He accomplished all that he came to do. He accomplished my salvation. It's already been done. There's nothing, there's no, uh, 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 you know, drama. (laughs) It's all done. I I don't have to guess where I'm going to live. I'm going to live in heaven forever and ever. And it's not because of my value, my commitment, my faith, my uh, any of the things of which I have done. It's all which, which he has done. And when I put my full heart into all that Jesus has done to save me, who didn't deserve it, he loved me. He gave his life and suffering and on the cross, and he stayed there. Every second Jesus stayed on the cross was another sin that he was paying for for me. He was paying for my sins. And when I look at him, all adoration, all worship, all thankfulness, all I can do is is bow my knees, get down on my knees, get on my face, and thank him for saving me. Thank him for loving me and giving himself for me that I may be go free. Not just after death, but in life. We have an abundant peace in our life. You know, the devil's throwing everything at you, all the curveballs and knuckleballs of life, and some of the things you get beamed and you get hit and you get, it hurts. But we know that God's in control and he's working all things after the the counsel of his own will, that he's on his throne, that he orchestrates all of it. Your path has already been laid out before you. God already knows how you're going to uh, uh, be a testimony. God already knows how you are going to Glorify God in your situations of life. But, you know, the first thing we need to do is put our hearts and our mind and our soul upon the accomplished work of Jesus Christ and Him alone. And and we commit our life to Him, realizing that that old life was going to a devil's hell forever. That old life had no rewards except pain and suffering and consequence. You don't think there's a consequence of sin today? If you go out and decide that you just want to be a drunk and still drive, well, there's going to be some consequence. If you decide you want to go out and be um, unfaithful and, and fornicate and have premarital sex and do this and do that, there's going to be some consequence. There is. God's not mocked. God is not mocked. And if you fear God, we know that. God is not mocked. But, oh, he forgives us, and we come to him, and, and when we put our affection and love and for what Christ has done for us, we understand that he is a lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, and he went to the cross. But we understand that the gospel does not stop at the cross. The gospel does not stop. The completion of salvation does not stop there. I like this thought, and think about this with me if you would. We as believers peak our emotions at the cross. Because we can somewhat, somewhat relate to Christ's sufferings. We know he suffered physically, mental, anguish. We can somewhat relate to the suffering of the Savior, the rejection which he had, the mockery he endured, his selflessness, his unconditional love that he stayed upon the cross. Christ proved God commendeth his love toward us and that, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us when we were his enemies. Christ displayed his love upon us, cross, uh, Jesus paying for our sins. We can identify with his sufferings, but we can't really identify with the resurrection. Not yet. That's something we can't identify with, but someday we will. Amen. Someday we'll know exactly how that goes. We'll be able to identify with the resurrection. Suffering we understand, pain we understand, sin bearing we understand that he bore our sins upon the cross. Uh, 
And, but if we want to concentrate on the resurrection, I believe we would be serving a very blessed purpose of biblical truth, trying to understand the resurrection as much as we can. For if Jesus did not rise, he's not the prophet, he's not the priest, he's not the king. If Jesus did not rise, he's just Jesus of Nazareth. He was just a man, just a good man. But he would still be in the grave. But, and we would still be in our sins. But he did die and he rose. And we see that Jesus did rise. He accomplished it. And why? Because in his resurrection, we are justified by his resurrection. What that means is that because Jesus rose... God the Father was pleased with the sacrifice of Jesus. That Jesus' work of paying for your sins, and if you believe today, your sins was accomplished. It was paid in full. And when Jesus died and was buried and he rose the third day, what that shows is that God's wrath was appeased. God poured out his wrath upon Christ on the cross as the sacrificial lamb. So I do not bear the wrath of God for my sins because Jesus bore them for me. I may bear consequence in this life for decisions and sins that I make, but I will not go to hell forever and ever because Jesus saved me and forgave me of my sins. And I'm only righteous before him because of Christ's righteousness. The resurrection of Jesus Christ accomplished the gospel. It accomplished salvation. The resurrection, he also, if you notice that Jesus didn't raise again in secret. (laughs) He didn't do it quietly. But he, as we saw, he he, uh, declared himself arose. That everybody saw Jesus. The 500, the 12, everybody was a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And even his ascension, all the eyes were beholding him. So Jesus didn't raise up in secret, but he declared, just as we saw in Romans chapter 1, how God has declared Jesus to be the Son of God with power, with the resurrection of the dead. Uh, The claim which Jesus claimed to be God himself is true. All the claims which Jesus made were true. His resurrection was witnessed by all. You know, and it's much different. This resurrection was different than the ones that we see in the the Gospels who were raised, like Lazarus and the the little girl who was raised. Uh, Jesus rose them up, but yet they still had to die. You know, he rose them, he restored them. There was a restoration, but not a resurrection, right? Resurrection means life from death. And this resurrection, we see that Christ is alive today and forevermore. And we will be in the likeness of his resurrection. Um, he made this appearance God declared that the sacrifice was accepted he declared that he's still alive even today if you deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ you deny his substitutionary death was accomplished at all that God rejected the sacrifice with the resurrection we know that God receives the sacrifice and we can be justified And that's why raising the resurrection means we can be justified. God can be just in justifying the ungodly, and God can be just in sending sinners to hell at the same time. Because what is it? God has given you a gift today. He has given you the gift of salvation, the gospel, which we preach, which you receive, in which you stand. If you've not believed in vain, if you've endured, if you truly are saved, and that's a self-examination, it's all with the heart, not with the head. It's all with the heart. You feel the presence of Christ. Now, not only does the resurrection provide the definition, it has to be, it's essential to the definition of the gospel and the accomplishment of the gospel, but it, it brings the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel is not health and wealth in this life. The hope of the gospel is the resurrection. And so uh, we need to understand how vital it is. Now, verse 51 through 58, I'm going to read this. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead 
shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, our bodies must put on incorruption. He's going to change our bodies. And this mortal shall, must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gave us the victory because Jesus Christ arose and he conquered death. Where is thy sting? Where's the victory? When this, in, when this corruptible shall put on incorruption. Oh, isn't it, isn't it something that we shall live forever in this body because Jesus has secured the victory. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. He accomplished it. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. As long as you live, verse 58, as long as you live, the resurrection is true. You're marching closer to the point that you're appointed to die. Let's focus and stay steadfast on the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're saved, we commit our lives to him. Because all our lives, whether I live, whether I die, I am the Lord's. And one golden day break, the clouds will spread and he will come for me. It'll be the greatest event in world history. There'll be, uh, we've already know what's going to happen. The world doesn't know yet. They're going to be shocked. But we do know that when he does come, the Bible says that every knee will bow. Every knee, the, the nastiest atheists on earth, their knees will bow. Every tongue will look up and confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. I'm saved today. I've received the gospel. I believe upon Jesus Christ who died for my sins. It's serious. If you dig deep, we, we know where we withdraw. We know where we reject. In Acts, we see this. Uh, Paul was preaching for a long time in a place, and everything was, you know, they were real tolerant of it, but pretty soon, it was the same message over and over and over, and pretty soon, the message of life became a message of death. What you're saying, Paul, what you're saying is if I don't receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, that my soul and my bodily resurrection is destined for hell. I'll be equipped to endure hell forever and ever, where the Bible says there'll be gnashing and wailing of teeth, and there'll be no one who can look up and accuse God of being unfair, because we've all sinned against God, our creator, our maker, the one who made the rules. It's him, but he loves you. He loves you. He knows you've failed. You know you've failed, and he loves you. And he gave himself a gift unto you that you should bring, uh, that you don't bring pride to the cross, that you bring him praise. And that's all you can bring. And thankfulness. And Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have saved me. Save me from the end that is promised from the word of God. The resurrection promises and it gives us the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel is we shall be saved. We're spiritually saved now, and we will soon be physically saved when he comes. And that is the gospel that has been declared unto you. Be Jesus said in John 14, 19, he says, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live. Amen. Because I live, Jesus said to his disciples, because I'm alive, you'll be alive. <laughs> aren't, you great, aren't you grateful that Christ arose from the dead, that he's alive, that we have a reign of life in Christ Jesus, that we're no longer under sin and condemnation of the law and always being guilty and, and knowing that we are undeserving, but we know that we turn, repent of our sins, and ask God to forgive us of our sins with all our heart and look to him and trust in him, believe in him that he paid for your sins and yours alone as if, it were, as if you were the only person he died for. 
that salvation. I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but we have to be raised again and in corruption because in verse 42 and 44, I, I do love this part. It actually brings comfort to my soul. I, I don't know how many have recently lost loved ones, but in verse 41 of the same chapter, uh, it says, There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, and one star drifteth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. Our bodies will be put in the grave in corruption. But what is it? It's we're promised. The hope of Jesus Christ's resurrection is the promise here that we have. But we have a promise that will be raised in power. We know that we're going to sow our natural body in verse 44, but it will be raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor, but it will be raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but raised in power. <laughs> It is sown a natural body and is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there is a spiritual body. John, in 1 John 3, 2, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, because we will see him as he is. What a promise. The resurrection is the promise of the gospel every living being alive who has ever lived will live forever we need to understand that we're going to live forever there's no oblivion there's no darkness there's no spiritual there's no uh, light or purgatory or someplace or reincarnation that the bible is simple in the truth and search your heart um, we will live forever we'll live in either eternal death or eternal life eternal suffering or eternal bliss in the presence of God. But we will have a body that will be able to endure whichever one of those two that we have. We will all be raised from the dead. Those who reject the gospel, they'll have a body suited for hell. And those who hear and believe the gospel will have a body suited for heaven. What about you today? The gospel has been declared to you. Have you received the gospel of Jesus Christ? As if for no one else was it for you. Do you see your soul's need? Do you see that you stand in jeopardy if you're lost today? Or maybe you need to recommit your life to Christ. That we need to endure. That we need to remain steadfast in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the life which he's called you to live in. And to bring him glory all the days of your life until he takes you home. But if you're not saved, the, the invitation's today. It's today. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised anything. We know that uh, life is short and can be short, and short for some. And, but we know that today is a day of salvation. Today is a day. Harden not your heart. Hear his voice. And we uh, ask Brother Chapman, if you'll come, please, and Sister Kathy. We'll just have a couple stanzas of invitation. Everybody stand, please. And if the Lord has talked to your heart at all, we invite you to come.